firm. India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters. Thank you for having me, Alok, and the Vidhi Legal Center for Center for Legal Policy. Um, now, this is an interesting beginning. It's an auspicious beginning, I think. Uh, and going back to the final hearings of the Shreya Singhal, what has become uh, known as the Shreya Singhal Judgment, but, um, of course, a large number of cases were tagged together, including the People's Union of Civil Liberties, which was the case that I argued, um, along with co-counsel Sanjay Parikh. Now, that final hearing actually began with gods, like many events in our country. A sheaf of papers was handed over with lurid pictures of various gods in various um, odd positions, and the point was that there are these terrible things that happen on the internet and government must be given broad, strong and coercive powers to deal with it. This is the way that the government began a number of uh, these hearings, I'm told, whether they were in the high courts or whether they were before other um, tribunals. Now, this actually turned out to be auspicious for us because it narrowed the ambit of the case in various ways. Uh, the judges were extremely clear that regardless of what goes on, a law can only be struck down as unconstitutional if the law on the face of it does not accord with the categories of Article 191A and 192. Now, this is being cited as a great case, right? What is a great case? When I saw this, I asked myself, what is a great case? Why do we say that Keshav Nanda Bharti is a great case? Or why do we say that, um, you know, why do we cite these various cases as, as great cases? It's, like to me, I think a great case is a case that strikes down an evil, but also lays the ground for future flourishing. And I think this case does both. Most of us know here, so the Shreya Singhal case, uh, just, just the Shreya Singhal petition, uh, when they went to court, was dealing with Section 66A. At that point, for the People's Union of Civil Liberties, we were preparing a comprehensive petition to deal with online free speech. This included section, the striking down of Section 66A, which on the face of it is blatantly unconstitutional. But this also included the secret website blocking by government without any transparency whatsoever. And um, thirdly, this also included um, forced takedown by private companies and forced private censorship on pain of losing their immunity. Now, in its judgment of March 20, uh, 24, the Supreme Court struck down a provision that criminalized speech after about 55 years. Section 3, so, uh, the Ramanuhar Lolia, um, which is the last ju judgment that did so, struck down Section 3 of the UP Special Powers Act, which criminalized a person who incited a person not to pay tax, who incited another person not to pay tax. In terms of what this judgment does, in addition to striking down this provision, is that it enumerates, it elucidates a number of doctrines. Right? Firstly, it's the doctrine of the chilling effect. Now, many of you, I can, see, I can see you nodding, and many of you will be familiar with this. Um, the chilling effect, essentially, is when there is some kind of crackdown by the state, whether it's an executive, whether it's a law, whether it's, um, whether it's a judgment, which then goes on to make people believe that they cannot speak and they, they must be silent for fear of some kind of stick price. Um, it can also apply when there is a non-state actor. For instance, if there's a mob outside your door, like in the Shaheen Dhada case, right? Why was, the, why was 66A used against her? In part because police was very thin on the ground and um, the hospital, her uncle's hospital was being attacked. 
and they didn't quite know what to do and under pressure and they thought that you know maybe this is the the correct thing to do they filed um these FIRs against her, right? So a chilling effect can also come from a mob. A chilling effect can also just come from a powerful person who's trying to intimidate. Um, now, the chilling effect has been cited before. But this judgment is the first instance in which it was cited as a reason for striking down a provision. And Justice, um, and this bench of ju Justice um, uh, Rohinton, Nariman and Justice Chalameshwar, what they do here is that they link the doctrine of overbreath to the doctrine of the chilling effect. Now what is the doctrine of overbreath? It's when you have a law that prohibits something that is must be illegal but also prohibits something that should be a part of our polity, should be part of our democracy. So 66A did a lot of this, right? Like 66A criminalized anything that was at the lowest threshold, annoying or inconvenient, and nobody really knew what that was. Now, annoying or inconvenient could be something that um, is defamatory, but it could also be something that is um, irritating, right? So if it's something that's irritating, surely that is the function of citizens before government, right? Like surely that is the function of people, um, uh, of the media. Surely that is the function of uh, democratic opposition to disagree, to debate, to enter into a deliberative process through which ideas may emerge. Um, The reason this is important is because a large number of our laws that deal with speech fall in the same problematic category. We have, for example, one of my favorites is actually section um, 298. And section 298 of the Indian Penal Code, basically at its lowest threshold, says that uttering a, if any, Whoever with the deliberate intention of wounding the religious feelings of any person makes any sound in the hearing of that person shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to one year. So now what does that mean? So does that mean if I say, I don't know, oink oink, or if I say moo, is that, does that qualify? Like how subjective is it? Um, it's not really defined adequately. Fortunately, um, this is not a cognizable offense, but many other speech offenses are. Now, what does this mean? It means that at the first instance, like in Section 66A, it is the local thanedar, the local constable who will decide. Is this annoying or inconvenient? No longer. But is this a sound? Uh, well, this isn't co cognizable, but is this a law that should apply when you are saying something and should that person come and arrest you. The trouble in our polity is that it is the process that is the punishment. So once an FIR is filed against you, it takes some time. Even if, if the, especially if it has been cleverly drafted. Under the law, it's very difficult to quash it in the High Court under Section 482. Um, but also, it means that if you have to go through a trial, and that is a slow trial, if it's cognizable and if you can be arrested, it means that you have entered the process of the criminal law, where we don't have enough judges, and we don't have also, on the flip side, enough police officers to protect you as a speaker when you are saying something that is unpopular, when you have heckler hecklers that cannot, under the Indian Constitution, under the Supreme Court's judgments, cannot and this judgment included, um, exercise what is called a heckler's veto and silence you. But we don't have enough police officers to protect you from that. So sometimes they actually you know, end up filing a case against you because they want to uh, um, um, you know, take the mob away. So in that sense, I think, Sort of bringing the doctrine of the chilling effect into our law is incredibly important, but also the doctrine of overbreath. What the bench has also done here is that they have looked at the difference between discussion, advocacy, and incitement. 
Advocacy is allowed, discussion is allowed, incitement is not. So here they cite a line of judgments where um, Jagjeevan Ram, for instance, where only if the speech is a spark in a powder keg, only if the speech is so proximate to provoking public disorder, for example, um, you know, can it be criminalized? You know, another favorite part, I mean, I, I like a lot of things about this judgment, but another, another part of it that I like quite a lot is that it speaks for the subaltern, that it kind of furthers the reasonable person test in our jurisprudence, right? Like, there's a way in which, you know, earlier, um, the speech, uh, the law on obscenity, for instance, you know, sections 292 and 294, etc. of the IPC, were interpreted in a particular way in the Hicklin test was applied, which is that what is obscene? If there is a mind that has a tendency to be corrupted, you know, that is the mind that we look at when we are looking at whether something should be obscene or not. I mean, surely it should be the reasonable person. Luckily, judgments since then have started using the community standard test. And I think increasingly the reasonable person test is coming into our law in this regard. Um, and here, the judges said this. That fear of serious injury cannot alone justify suppression of free speech and assembly. Men feared witches and burnt women. It is the function of speech to free men from the bondage of irrational fears. Now, this is particularly interesting to me because nowhere else really does he talk about men. You know, they talk about people. Um, so there is a way in which they are addressing power differentials in speech and saying that um, rationality is important and it is a reasonable person that we must um, use as a litmus test when we are dealing with issues of free speech. Now coming to website blocking. To me, website blocking is, you know, there's been a certain, there's been a particular debate around it, especially within the free speech, um, the online free speech community in particular, and a very heated debate, right? Particularly since in the end of the judgment, the um, court says that we are not interfering with the website blocking rules. Now, the website blocking rules were challenged by the People's Union of Civil Liberties and by um, no other party, and I was the only one who argued it. What happened in court here was particularly interesting. Um, we would make various arguments, and the government would say, but we agree with that, right? Whereas, of course, this is not the way it was being applied at all. So the, there were various very reasonable concessions made by government, which I can see a lot of you not yet, presumably you were in court at that time, right? Um, there were various very reasonable concessions made by government that were not actually being um, uh, applied in, in the process of the law. So what, what I said in court at that point was that if this can be recorded, you know, if this way of applying these rules can be recorded, then that is perfectly acceptable to us, which is something that the judges accepted and agreed with, and we agreed that this would limit the ambit of the, of the debate, of the, the arguments, rather. Um, these concessions are recorded in the government's written submissions. The government has said clearly that they will issue notice to not just the intermediary, when there is speech that they don't like, or when there is speech that they feel uh, is unlawful in terms of the particular categories of the Constitution that are reproduced in, article, in Section 69, um, but that they will also issue notice to the originator under the law, which is the person who's uploading the speech, right? So, for example, what used to happen earlier is that if the government wanted to block, say, something that I said on Facebook, right, they would get in touch with Facebook, they would not get in touch with me. So they were saying that, okay, we will get in touch with the person who is uploading the content. The second thing that they said in the written submissions that hasn't come across as clearly in the judgment is that they said that, the, look, the re Rule 16 that requires secrecy in blocking um, will only be applied in part, which is that the secrecy will only speak to the identity of the person who is uh, seeking the blocking. 
if it is a person or even if it's a government entity, but that the action itself need not be secret. Um, now, the court has been very clear on this. The court has said, and there's certain procedural morality, I think, that has been brought in. The court has said that reasons must be given. The court has said that the high court may apply its lens of constitutional review, judicial review, to any speech that is blocked. Um, it says that a hearing must happen. Um, uh, and the hearing must uh, in the hearing the originator must be heard and I think in the scheme of things it would be unreasonable to presume that these orders can any longer be secret um, now in terms of the intermediary uh, the intermediary guidelines um, <coughs> What was happening earlier was that under sort of Rule 3 to be of the intermediary guidelines, essentially, if something was, you know, basically <coughs> insulting, then it was the intermediary's duty under law to take particular posts down or like to take speech down if they had actual knowledge. Now that can only be done through a court order or, and this I'm not sure is a positive thing, if the government asked them to do so. So one extremely positive thing that has happened is that uh, companies are no longer required to be censors, you know, and incentivized to censor a lot more than they otherwise would because they would otherwise lose their safe harbor and they otherwise it would leave them open to criminal and civil prosecution. Um, which And now only under a court order can they be required to take down content. But the, the one downside is that there are two downsides, I think. One downside is that now the government can ask companies to take down content or any other intermediary, not just a company, an individual as well. But also, I think that when there is something that, uh, there's another downside to this, something that should be legitimately taken down, like um, so, for instance, with child pornography, intermediaries basically themselves take it down, um, actively so, whether it's reported or not, and this is true around the world. So, intermediaries anyway sort of make particular decisions, right? Like even though they're private companies or private individuals, they will decide, is this something that is just a family picture of a kid running around, or is this child pornography, you know? So these are sort of fine determinations that private actors are, have taken upon themselves, but are also forced to make. Uh, in the same way, there was an alternative formulation that we did put across to the court. And that alternative formulation was that if in a system of notice and counter notice, if it is blatantly obvious that there is something that violates the law, then, um, this, then the intermediary can make an interim decision on whether the content gets taken down or not, preferably with an external actor, like in the, say, in the Vishakha cases. And then after that, that can be challenged in court. But once intermediary applies their mind, they receive a safe harbor. And um, uh, all it does is that it decides that decision-making process within the intermediary company or by the intermediary individual, it decides who goes to court, who has the burden to get a lawyer and in civil uh, litigation, very, very, very rarely, in very uh, uh, few cases, do you get legal aid. Um, you know, so who who has the burden of going to court? Um, it's not that this formulation doesn't have issues, right? Like, so for example, your intermediary may be one person who's based in Norway, but whose website is accessible in India and who doesn't know anything about Indian law. You know. Um, but, um, but, you know, but this is one of the alternative formulations that we did put across. So this is something to look out for. And this can perhaps be dealt with in sort of these multi-stakeholder conversations and that are being had increasingly um, and, you know, terms of service, sort of voluntary commitments of various sorts. Now, what was it that worked here? I think... There were a number of things, right? Like, I think we didn't self-edit, for instance. 
um, you know, we challenged us was a very comprehensive petition, and we challenged Section 66A, yes, but we also <laughs> sort of wanted natural justice and constitutionality read into the website blocking rules, and we also were challenging the intermediary rules. Now, this seems like a lot, right? Like to go to court and say that, look, uh, this act passed by Parliament, there's uh, problem A, problem B, problem C, and can you, like, basically strike down and read various things into all of this? Um, but I think we went with the principle of it which is that if this is wrong, if this is constitutional, then it must be challenged. And let us not self-edit. And if the court does not want to interfere, let the court not interfere. We will make our arguments, we will do our work, we will build our coalitions, and we will sort of do our best to hit the bullseye. And then after that, let the court decide. Um, I think the second thing that worked very well was the collaboration. When I first came into this case in... Um, uh, about 2011, 2012, there were sort of various parts of, um, uh, you know, there were various aspects of tech that I didn't quite get, like how it worked, for instance, you know. And I basically set about educating myself and getting help. Um, and uh, at that point, you know, uh, sort of I and... Um, the uh, colleague who has uh, be, been assisting me sort of extremely well in this case, uh, Par Gupta, uh, you know, basically reached out to the Center for Internet and Society, you know, Pranay Prakashan, you know, the, the wonderful Sunil Abraham, um, and also uh, Chinmay Arun and um, uh, at NLU Delhi and, uh, you know, Sarbjit's team. Um, also, you know, Lawrence Liang and others. Well, Lawrence isn't a tech person so much, but he's more a free speech person. But, you know, and I set about kind of educating myself on how the tech worked. That's when I got on Twitter. I mean, <laughs> otherwise, it just seemed like way too much noise. But the thing is, Twitter is a bit like Hotel California, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can check out, but you can never leave. Um, but, um, but I think actually going through the process oneself is... You know, wh that's when, you know, I sort of realized the sort of differences, for instance, between takedown and blocking, you know. So for those of you who are, who are sort of not aware, takedown is basically if the whole content is taken down for the whole world. And blocking is, sent and these are sort of broad definitions, but blocking is if particular types of content is just blocked for your country. Um, and, I mean, it's interesting. It doesn't take, it just takes a lot of hard work, a lot of humility, and a lot of consultation, you know, um, to become an expert. Uh, and I would say that in the tech field, and the tech law field in particular, that it's important, I think, for women to not hesitate to enter this field. I think sometimes there are artificial barriers that are created. There's a certain amount of mansplaining, you know, in this field, um, which I've surprisingly never got in, you know, in my 15 years of practice in um, arguing other constitutional cases. But, but it's important to, it's, a, it's very important to overcome that, right? Um, also, you know, in court... The, the Shreya single case was argued by Soli Sorabji. Uh, PUCL was argued by um, Sanjay Parik and uh, by, I, uh, by me. Um, there was a case for interme the Intermediaries Association that was argued by Sai Krishna. Uh, Sajan Povaya was for, um, was for, uh, for the MP who uh, speaks out a lot about free speech. There was also, there was one more, there was Sham Divan also, who was arguing for mouth shut. Now, there was a lot of collaboration between all of us, you know. For example, when there was a point being argued that looked like it was, let's say somebody was going before us, that was sort of setting the mind of the judge. Um, and, you know, sometimes by the time, like, it's your turn to argue, the judge on a particular point has already sort of asked the questions and has already uh, kind of decided, you know, what he or she thinks. But at that point, you know, we would hand over those judgments. We would sort of assist uh, in terms of answering questions. We would sort of hand over particular formulations of the law. 
Um, also, there was, you know, so there, it was very fluid in that way. I mean, I think the eye was very much on the win, right? Because the win is important. That yes, you can do your best and, you know, all that is very well, but I think winning <laughs> and having that killer instinct is extremely important. And in many cases, the interesting thing is that it is the killer instinct that requires you to collaborate, right? That requires you to put your ego aside. And that requires you in the interests of, you know, what you believe in. Um, but also just the brief you have, it's a private case if it's for a company, right? To just make sure that you are keeping your eye on the ball. Now, there are a number of challenges ahead. You know, and for those of you who are lawyers, and for those of you who are law students, and for those of you who are legal policy makers, uh, I think that this judgment can, I would urge you to read this judgment, and I would urge you to read it, uh, read it in detail. Because one thing that this judgment has, and the one thing that it brings is courage. It is a two-judge bench that has basically overhauled the face of online speech in India, and the face of speech, constitutional speech in general. There are a number of laws that we have that are problematic. We have Section 124A on sedition, which at its lowest threshold, if you excite disaffection against the government, right, um, can send you to jail. Now, the Bombay High Court has recently done an excellent job in the Sim Trivedi case of limiting that. However, the Supreme Court, unfortunately, um, in a constitutional bench, um, failed to strike it down, right? This is a bench of two judges. Um, there is the tyranny when we look at challenges there is the tyranny of the crowd the crowd in human mobs and online media there is the tyranny of corporate cross ownership that limits the kind of news that we get and that shapes sometimes the kind of news that we get. It's the kind of issue that we are discussing in the net neutrality debate and the, the issue that people have understood very well in the net neutrality debate, which is that, for example, if I, um, if I am the ISP, the internet service provider, and I own the pipes, like you basically subscribe to my plan, then I should not decide that what content you get. You should be able to access whatever content there is. Um, but we forget this principle when we are looking at particular TV channels and their cross-ownership with various other industries. And we forget, you know, when we see the news, you know, very often on television. I used to be a television journalist, actually, for a year uh, when I was 19 years old. Um, and, you know, sometimes in television, people think that seeing is believing, you know? And you think, oh, TV pe dekha tha. But you don't quite, like, apply the filter that you apply in the rest of your criti critical life. Like, and um, sort of see what is being reported, what as importantly is not being reported. Why is this thing being reported in the way it is? I think another challenge there is is the singular idea of national interest that is sought to be propagated through various, through governmental crackdowns and through various laws, including the Foreign Contributions Regulations Act. Um, our constitution is our own, but among the contributions of this judgment is its comparison of our free speech, the structure of our free speech regime, to the U.S. regime. And the intellectual confidence and leadership by which this bench drew on ideas that may have been either cited in argument or in written submissions, of course, in the precedent of the courts, of our courts, but also in the precedent of foreign, uh, other courts, including the U.S. court, um, the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Nariman told us in court that this paragraph that I'm going to read is a particular favorite of his. It is in tribute to the bench that laid down this extremely important judgment. And I'm going to end with this. This is from Whitney versus California. And this is Justice Brandeis in his famous concurring judgment. Um, this is cited with approval in uh, Shia Singhal versus the Union of India. Those who won our independence believed that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties. 
and that in its government the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believed liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth. That without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile. That with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine. That the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people. That public discussion is a political duty. And that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. They recognize the risks to which all human institutions are subject, but they knew that order cannot be secured merely through fear or punishment of its infraction. That it is hazardous to discourage thought, hope, and imagination, that fear breeds repression, that repression breeds hate, that hate menaces stable government, and that the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and proposed remedies and that the fitting remedy for evil counsels is good ones. Believing in the power of reason as applied through public discussion, they eschewed silence coerced by law, the argument of force in its worst form. Recognizing the occasional tyrannies of governing majorities, they amended the Constitution so that free speech and assembly should be guaranteed. I think the laws that we've inherited are from a colonial government that did not have an interest in free speech, that did not have an interest in hearing what our subjects had to say. Many of the laws that suppress free speech in India are inherited um, from that source and are in the IPC of 1860. Many of these, I believe, need to be read down or need to be struck down. Also, we have increasingly the push towards unitary thought in public life. We have, for instance, lists released by the censor board, which say things like violence against women, and I quote, will not be permitted in English, but it is fine in Hindi. We are told that the word Bombay is something that is not permissible. We are told that the, word, the lesbian must be bleeped out of a film. Now, it's a good time to be a lawyer, and it's a good time <laughs> to be a policy person, because there's a lot of work to be done. And I think the greatest contribution of this judgment is that it gives a very clear signal of what our constitution is, what our rights are as a polity, but also what each one of us, whether we are lawyers, whether we are journalists, whether we are policy people, or whether we are just people on Twitter, what we need to do about it. Thank you. The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax, and audit matters.